Hello and welcome. My name is Richard Heaton and this is a talk about habitual criminals, drunkards and travelling criminals, largely using records from the UK. What I'm going to cover is firstly my unexpected family history and a neighbour's unexpected family history. We'll have a quick look at what constituted an habitual criminal and then the records that, for family history purposes that flowed from the Habitual Criminals Act 1869 and Prevention of Crimes Act 1871. We're then going to have a quick look at habitual drunkards and round off with a look at travelling or itinerant criminals. We will begin with my unexpected family history. I have been actively researching my family history since my early teens. My initial research involved civil registration records, that's births, marriages and deaths, census records, parish records and wills. And having started my research so young, I also had the opportunity of asking my grandparents' generation what they could remember about their parents and grandparents. This gave me a blend of records, written, printed and spoken, collectively making up my various trees. But family history is always really work in progress. There are those annoying loose ends and occasional inconsistencies, which leads me to my unexpected family history. It concerns my great great grandfather and family, whose photograph you can see here. This is Francis William Spanswick. Born in 1836 and baptised in 1838, he was the youngest of eight children. His father, Roger, a silversmith, died when Francis was young, and he was apprenticed to Stephen Crouch, a pocket book maker, and is listed with the Crouch family in the 1851 census of St Giles, Cripplegate. In 1859, he married Susanna Mary Cutris at Bethnal Green, and they had three daughters. But tragically, so the story goes, Susanna died shortly after the birth of her youngest daughter in 1867, my great-grandmother. Francis, grieving from the loss of Susanna, paid another family to bring up my great-grandmother, and indeed she is absent from the family group in the 1871 census. However, the family my mother great-grandmother was boarded with discovered that she had a great singing voice and put her on the stage. Francis had no knowledge of this until a friend saw my great-grandmother and let him know. He was furious and took my great-grandmother back immediately and she appears in the 1881 census aged 13. In later years my great-aunt and grandmother would visit him and my great aunt would play the, his piano for him and they had a great memories of Francis. The photograph shows him as a smartly dressed Victorian. He died aged 74 in 1910 and left no diaries or letters. I only have the photograph and one letter sent to him in the 1880s from a sister who had married and emigrated to Canada. And that might have been it. However, thanks to Find My Past and Ancestry, a lot of unexpected family history has emerged. Not just the solution to some tricky loose ends, for no death certificate has been found for Susanna. And Francis also states in the 1871-81 census that he's actually married, years after Susanna's supposed death. I'll save that for another day but also the following. New information is continually being made available online. Where I guess it's the most easily accessible nowadays for most family historians to do their research. As I say, I didn't have any great expectations of finding anything new about Francis. And then Find My Past did a lot of work on 
England and Wales Crime, Prison and Punishment, in which they included details of a series HO 140. And on typing in Spanswick, up came Francis and the details shown here. Francis Spanswick, age 38, pocket bookmaker. And of course, we are talking about crime. He was charged at Clerkenwell Police Court on the 5th of July, 1876, with obtaining by false and fraudulent pretenses from William Henry Crane, the sum of five shillings with intent to defraud. He was found guilty of obtaining money by false pretenses. And for five shillings, he was sentenced to six calendar months in the House of Correction, Cold Bath Fields, near where he lived in Clerkenwell. Obviously quite a shock. We'll see later that Francis William Spanswick was one of a huge number of individuals who were sentenced to prison from 1869 to 1876. What it also gave me was the possibility that we might find other records uh, relating to Francis in the prison records. And we'll come on to that later. But before we do, I need to take you to see a neighbour, a neighbour's unexpected family history. And no, we're not going to be breaking any um, confidentiality um, in sharing neighbour's history. This neighbour lived a fair time ago. The neighbour I want to introduce to you is Thomas' neighbour. I came across Thomas over 20 years ago. I was researching a family who lived in Windsor from the early 19th century uh, who related to me. And by doing so, I was going through a newspaper called the Windsor and Eaton Express. At that time, I could only view the Windsor and Eaton Express on microfilm. But I found it such an interesting paper that I took copies and I made transcripts, which eventually I put on the web. Thomas appeared quite frequently. He was probably the first um, habitual criminal I've come across, habitual petty criminal, I should say, and quite possibly the first habitual drunkard. But he was treated relatively leniently, I would say, by the Windsor populace for a long time. So I want to start off by giving you a little bit of an overview of Thomas um, from the very first time he appears, as far as I'm aware, in the Windsor and Eaton Express in 1836. And we'll pick up on Thomas's story later in the presentation. On Monday, a miserable looking object named Thomas Neighbour, but who is better known for the sobriquet of Cold Morning, was charged with having on Saturday night stolen a four pound brass weight from the shop of Mr. Bannister, the butcher, and a new clothes basket from the premises of Mrs. Thompson, Coopers and Basket Makers. The prisoner was seen to steal the basket and was making off with it when he was taken into custody. On his way to prison, he threw away a brass weight, which on inquiry was found to belong to Mr. Bannister. Neither of the complainants been in attendance. The prisoner was remanded until Thursday, when he was again brought up, but it was stated that Mrs. Thompson and Mr. Bannister declined to prosecute. So the magistrates, after a suitable reprimand, discharged the prisoner. And that takes us to what was an habitual criminal? Well, it was simply a criminal who committed more than one offence. Francis William Spanswick, as far as I know, was not an habitual criminal and I cannot trace him in any habitual criminal records. Thomas Neighbour, if he had been born a little bit later, might well have acquired the habitual criminal status. 
The legal story, for our intents and purposes, will start with the Habitual Criminals Act 1869. This created two registers for all persons convicted of a crime. There will be a register for England that will be held by the Metropolitan Police in London and a register for Ireland held by the Commissions of Police for Dublin Metropolis. It's worth pointing out that the Act was drafted um, to cover England and Ireland, but thereby, because Wales would have been included, I'm sorry, within the definition of England, it omitted Scotland. The information for the registers was to be provided by returns submitted from time to time by jailers or governors of county and borough prisons and chief officers of police. Now, from time to time, obviously, is a bit vague, but information was definitely flowing in um, to the Metropolitan Police in London, if not the commissions of police in Dublin. That said, there must have been some concerns. Well, firstly, because Scotland had been omitted from the legislation. So the Prevention of Crimes Act followed pretty swiftly in 1871. And this added the third register for all persons convicted of a crime in Scotland. So there were now three registers, one for England with the Met Police, one for Scotland, um, which was supposed to be managed by the secretary to the manager of the general prisons at Perth, and one for Ireland, commissioners of police, again, for Dublin Metropolis. And there was a bit of tightening up um, of some of the other areas of the 1869 Act. The jailer or governor of the prison uh, shall make returns of the persons convicted of crime and coming within his custody, which is pretty similar to the previous Act, but there was now a penalty. Failure to comply or willfully submitting a return containing any false or imperfect statement, there was a penalty of up to £20 per offence. What was really new were there are now regulations as to the photographing of all prisoners convicted of crime who may be from time to time confined in any prison within Great Britain or Ireland. So any prisoner in any jail within Ireland or Great Britain should have had their photograph taken. Because if they'd refused, and I guess they, they could have refused, um, if they decided they weren't going to obey that regulation or any other, but specifically from our interest, the photographic regulation, then they would be deemed guilty of an offence against prison discipline, which would have incurred a punishment. I mentioned previously that I've got a pretty substantial collection of original newspapers. I've also got a pretty substantial collection of original books, directories and other works which I can refer to for family history. Amongst that collection are a number of registers of habitual criminals. The earliest of these uh, was published in 1876 and it's an alphabetical list of the habitual criminals from 1869 to 1876, first quarter. During that time, there have been submitted by these governors of prisons, who we referred to earlier, they'd sent in details of over 179,000 individuals. So potentially there were over 179,000 individuals, and this may just be the individuals submitted to uh, London, Bow Street, and excluding Scotland and excluding Ireland, it's not clear from the descriptions, but that could be 179,000 individuals who, who would have had their photographs taken. The alphabetical register is a subset of that, so it's not 179,000 names with their descriptions, unfortunately, um, but it's the these are the habitual criminals, the repeat offenders. And it contained over 12,000 names, 12,000 individuals, that is, um, who had over accounted for over 21,000 convictions. And 
most of whom, if not all of them, had aliases. And together with aliases, there are 21,000 names in this document, the Alphabetical Register of Habitual Criminals. And just to be clear, this is really picking up only individuals convicted of an indictment of a crime and previous conviction is proved against them. So these are only repeat offenders. So it's only a small subset, though an important subset, of the 179,000. One of the points of interest, not necessarily so much for family historians, but for those who might be interested in crime and how police were tackling crime, they did try to put together some statistics. So they tried to basically put together something around the where the criminals were born, the habitual criminals were born, and the and the percentage rate of the population. So they could have some idea of the ranking. And while London has the largest number of habitual criminals, because of the size of the London population, it works out relatively small. And there are, there are therefore quite a few other towns and cities which as a percentage of the population had a much higher level of habitual criminals. But we'll look at the detail in just a second. But before we do, just a quick overview of what was printed. The first register of habitual criminals, the one containing the 12,000 names, ran from 18, late 1869 through to the first quarter of 1876. Thereafter, regular prints were made of habitual criminals. I think there were probably annual printed volumes. And occasionally you would get consolidated volumes, which would have been particularly useful. Having several years together, it would make it much easier to, to search, be less paper. They ran up well past into the 20th century, I believe, probably finishing sometime in the 1920s. However, I can only really confirm what was in them up to 1893 which is the last and most recent copy I have. You can see basically the same information was being recorded um, all the way through from those 1869 through to 1893. We have, and this is I guess what, what interests family historians, um, the name and alias. So here we've got William Adamson, and it refers you also to see Blackett and Cuthbert. You'll get an age, a height, a hair color and eye color, a facial complexion, a trade or occupation, if relevant. You'll get details of the prison from which William was liberated and the date he was liberated, the offense uh, for which he was convicted and the sentence and whether there was any supervision required and that will be he would need to report back to a police station on a regular basis. In this case, we can see it's seven years. The intended residence had to be given as well. So where you intended to live uh, after you were liberated. And finally, there'd be details of any marks or remarks. And these are exactly the same uh, description that appears in the deserters lists. And typically here we're talking about um, anything that's obvious, such as scars, uh, tattoos. We're talking about and any other injuries you may actually have, any other old injuries. And that was all being used as ever, um, should you need to be identified again because you were suspected of having committed a crime. And boy, if you were expected to have committed a crime, you were almost certainly trying to use another name, another alias um, to avoid getting convicted. So we have these registers of individuals, of habitual criminals. It's probably worth just reflecting on how they were supposed to work. And this was a fairly consistent approach from the instructions given at the front of these registers from 1876 through to 1893. Let's suppose we have somebody in custody who says his name is John Albury. 
We look up in the habitual criminals lists and we can't find any mention of anyone called John Albury. So this could be a first offence. But we suspect this isn't the case and the person who calls himself John Albury may have gone under a previous name. This may be an alias. So we examine John Albury for any distinctive marks. Fortunately, there's some quite obvious marks for us to make notes of. He's got a long scar on the right side of his face. On his right arm, he's got a ship tattoo. And on the second finger of his right hand, he's got a ring tattooed. We refer to the list of habitual criminals. We can look for criminals who have scars and scars on the right side of their face. And that narrows it down. And then we can look for within those individuals for any that have tattoos, that any tattoos that match uh, those on John Albury. And we find, having done that, there's an individual called Thomas Reed, listed with these distinctive marks. The next step, because what's interesting, the registrars, the uh, these individuals and who were collecting this list do not have the photographs. They then need to apply to the prison governor from which Thomas Reed was liberated for a copy of the photograph. Or failing that with assistance with the person who's acquainted with him. So it wasn't that easy a task and you can imagine it would take a fair bit of time. But sadly, those photographs were not being held centrally. They were held up and down the country and held in the ownership of the prison governor. There appears to be no copy at that stage. Just worth reflecting as well how many habitual criminals there may have been. I was under the impression these registers had petered out in the 1920s, but they may well have extended even further than that. The register from 18 93, the last one I have, mentions that the initial pub from the initial publication in 1876 to 1893, their list of habitual criminals had reached over 76,000 individuals. What we can also look at is Find My Past have indexed 151,000 habitual criminals from MEPO 6, and these cover the years. 1881 to 1936. Based therefore on the estimates that I've got, because there were annual, annual figures published, you would expect there to be between 1876 and 1936, almost 182,000 individuals. And that must have taken quite a lot of searching. And a photograph may well have existed of Francis William Spanswick taken at the House of Correction, Coldbath Fields, either when he arrived in 1876 or before he departed in early 1877, after he completed his six month sentence. But sadly, and this seems to be fairly common, no surviving photographic records of prisoners in Coldbath Fields so far have been traced. So that was habitual criminals. And now we move on to habitual drunkards. Um, these records are much smaller series. The images I'm showing here, uh, all from information that was shared by, by an ex metropolitan police officer uh, before they ever got onto the web through MEPO. The metropolitan police were circulating uh, photographs uh, and descriptions of habitual drunkards on a weekly basis to pubs and clubs across London. And they were doing this from roughly 1903 to 1914. Find My Past have indexed, as far as I'm aware, 5,800 individuals, just over 5,800. And the genealogist may have done the same thing. I'm not aware of that they're on ancestry, but I may have missed it. Other police forces, I should make 
clear were also uh, documenting uh, habitual drunkards in their area. As I say, these images, they can be found on my old site on Brutes Web if you're interested. So what information might you find? If you were lucky enough and somebody you're interested does appear in this relatively small series, the first thing there would be a photograph and it's usually you get these a profile and an image facing the camera. This is James Hargreaves and he's distinctive because he seems to be wearing a soldier's uniform. And this is what we'd find out about him. Under name and alias, his name is James Hargreaves, alias the Shah, and this incidentally is from 1903. We've got a residence in Clerkenwell. So he may well have bumped into my, um, my ancestor, um, Francis William Spanswick. He's age 40. He's five foot five and a quarter. Build is stiff. I'm not quite sure what that means. And complexion fresh. Uh, hair light brown and they've kindly added thin on top. He's got hazel eyes. He didn't have whiskers or a moustache. He's got a broad nose that turns left and a round face. It didn't really come out on the photograph, but he's got scars over the right eyebrow and right cheek. His left ear is deformed and he's got his arms and body tattooed. And by profession or occupation, he's a costermonger. Before we move on to traveling or itinerant criminals, I thought I might bring to your attention uh, a rare book uh, from the USA. Now, I'm sure there's quite a few countries that were doing similar documentation uh, across Europe of professional or traveling criminals. Uh, this was published in 1886 um, in the USA by Thomas Burns, who was the head of the New York Constabulary at the time. And it can be found on the Internet Archive. And I believe it documents over 240 traveling criminals, most of which I think have got photographs. As well worthwhile having a look if you get a chance. Again, you'll get some, you'll get quite detailed biographies and descriptions of their crimes. We're coming towards the end of the presentation now, and I just want to bring to your attention another series of records. These were published by the Convict Supervision Office at New Scotland Yard and are called the Illustrated Circulars. The example we have here, I've just I've only got very few indeed, is from 1906. And they were issued by the Registrar of Habitual Criminals. These are photographs and descriptions of what were called travelling criminals or itinerant criminals. Which I've seen described as as slippery as eels. And Hertfordshire Record Office has a collection of these, should you wish to refer to them. On the front page of the document is almost a postcard size photograph, which is subdivided with lots of face on pictures of the travelling criminals. If you look closely, you may notice that there's some writing on some of them. And that's actually quite fine. Writing on these documents is really common. You find it throughout the Police Gazette because these are working documents. And invariably, what we've got written across some of these pictures is dead. And sometimes at the back, there may be some details about what actually happened to the individual that the officers made a note of in the in the record. And here's an example of the information that would accompany the photographs on the front of the illustrated circular. You can see there's various notes written on here, annotations if you like, and as I've said, these are really quite common on all manner of police documents and can add quite a bit of information that hasn't actually been printed, which makes, if you like, to a certain extent, potentially the document unique. We're starting off with names and aliases. 
the individual will just run through the white chap at the top is George Stevens and his aliases are Edward Perry, Ernest Perry, John Carruthers, John Shaw and Charles Atkinson. He's in trouble, he's, he's, um, his last and previous convictions, so the earliest conviction they've got a record of is from 1877 at Middlesex Sessions. He's in trouble in Middlesex, Cambridge, Middlesex again, Winchester, Oxford, Nottingham, Clerkenwell. And then there's some further notes underneath that. These foreign say from 1877 um, up to 1900, but there's a, a note in pen which has been added, which is post 1900. And we're moving from attempted fraud, stealing, burglary, failing to report, receiving stolen goods. And then we have lists of the sentences. We have his descriptions, such as date of birth, um, height and so forth, which is fairly normal. And whether he's got any particular um, peculiarities. So he's got a mole on his left cheek. And there's a problem with the tip of his left, of his little finger, which has been crushed. And then we come on to remarks, and these are basically details of um, how he operates. So he says here he's selecting, he's selecting a shop or temporary unoccupied private residence, and he'll find a way in through a window or break in, presumably through the roof in some way from the description, uh, cutting through, and then he'll steal. And he'll do this particularly residences, he's saying, I think, near the river bank and works with a, works in inverted commas with a companion who is sometimes a woman. And sometimes they'll give details of the individuals who they're actually working with. At the beginning of the presentation, I introduced two individuals to you. My great great grandfather, Francis William Spanswick, who appears to be a one off offender, not a habitual criminal and a gentleman called Thomas Neighbour, who I mentioned was a habitual criminal, if a petty criminal, I should add, and possibly a habitual drunkard. And I just wanted to share a little bit more about him on the following couple of slides. I've done this really just to demonstrate that with a bit of luck and a really good local paper, you can add a lot more colour than we can find in other records. Now Thomas Neighbour, alias Cold Morning, I found appearing in the Windsor and Eaton Express between 1836 and 1852. He started in 1836 stealing that basket and a brass weight. By 1838 he hasn't really progressed, he's, he's basically in trouble for for a cloth bag and a knife. In 1839, he's in trouble twice um, with a quantity of seeds, which is stolen, and then a nail bag and garden peas. In 1844, he's drunk and disorderly. In 1848, he's found begging. And finally, in 1852, he's in trouble for vagrancy and then he gets 31 days hard labour. And these have all been traced through one newspaper title, as I say, the Windsor and Eaton Express. And if you're lucky and you're looking at an individual like this and you've got a really good local newspaper, then you can construct a similar sort of history. And it, obviously behind each one of these is an actual little report. And I'll finish on one last report from Thomas Neighbour. This is from 1844. On Monday last, Thomas Neighbour, better known by the cognomen Cold Morning, a drunken and dissolute character, was brought before the Mayor H. Spratley Esquire, charged with drunken disorderly on the morning of the previous day, bracket Sunday. 
he was fined five shillings or to be placed in the stocks four hours when he at once preferred being placed in the stocks and that's it I hope you've enjoyed this talk covering habitual criminals habitual drunkards and traveling or itinerant criminals not to mention briefly meeting my great great grandfather and Thomas Neighbour. Thank you for listening.